Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this live stream presentation hosted by Peak of White Dwarf Stars from Discovery to Appreciation to Science Labs, um, presented by Dr. Paul Bradley. Uh, I'm Rick Wallace of the Parito Environmental Education Center, or Peak, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and I will be the moderator for today's talk. Uh, today's talk is being recorded, by the way. Uh, we are able to, to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors. So special thanks to them. Uh, we'll send an evaluation form after the talk and we'll use your comments to improve future programs. Uh, if you have questions, we encourage those. Um, Paul will be taking questions via Zoom chat. So see if you can find the chat button on your interface and type your questions for Paul into the chat window anytime during the presentation. And I will relay the questions to Paul uh, at the end of the presentation. Now let me introduce Paul Bradley. Um, Paul, go ahead and turn on your video. Uh, Paul grew up in Texas and discovered astronomy as a toddler when the star that he found turned out to be a satellite. The first books he read were on astronomy and space exploration. His first two degrees were in chemical engineering and physics. Uh, while studying physics, he discovered the fascinating world of white dwarf stars and made studying their pulsations the subject of his PhD research. He came to Los Alamos in 1993 to do physics research and still does stellar astronomy in his spare time. And uh, I will add thanks to those of you who are here. Um, I realize that tonight is the first of the Friday night concerts, and I appreciate you uh, using the first part of that time to uh, join us instead. So thank you for doing that. And uh, Paul, why don't you uh, go ahead and start up? Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, can uh, people see my slides? Looks great. Okay, well, um, let's go ahead and uh, start up. So I'll be talking about white dwarf stars tonight. And um, here's a few uh, illustrations you'll be seeing more of later on. So um, to start with, uh, why do we care about uh, white dwarfs? Well, they are by far and away the most common endpoint of stellar evolution, how stars uh, burn hydrogen to helium and eventually uh, uh, consume their nuclear fuel, and as we'll see later in this hour, uh, cool down. 97% roughly of uh, stars that um, form uh, will become a white dwarf. They are the most common macroscopic object where relativity, quantum mechanics, and statistical mechanics dominate. Their structure offers clues to their past. What was the progenitor main sequence star? We can use white dwarfs because they are cooling and the structure is relatively simple to determine the cooling age of uh, our local galactic disk um, and globular clusters, and then confirm the properties of very dense matter. So just a brief outline. Uh, I won't spend much time here to talk about discovery the impact of quantum mechanics and relativity on their properties, how the stars form, um, how we find them nowadays, a little bit about dense plasma physics because we'll need that for later on, and then uh, how white dwarf cooling determines the age of stellar populations, the fact that some of them pulsate, how white dwarfs impact cosmology, and then a little bit about the future. So the initial discovery um, was as, uh, is somewhat typical in astronomy, kind of an accident. Uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel, uh, also known for Bessel functions, as you can see on the uh, uh, stamp issued by Germany in the upper right corner, um, measured the position of the brightest star in the nighttime sky, Sirius. Uh, the goal was to build a reference frame. Byproduct was measuring parallax of stars for the first time. 
And this call, he discovered that Sirius wobbled over a period of years. It did not follow a straight line. And using Kepler's law, figured out pretty quickly, oh, there's a second star. It has half the mass of Sirius. So Sirius is twice the mass of the sun. This star was the same mass as the sun, but invisible. Okay, that's interesting. Well, jump forward a few years, about 1862 instead of around 1840, and Alvin Clark Jr. first uh, discovered the companion to Sirius by accident. Um, he was testing the uh, lens for a big refractor and called his dad over and said, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah. Well, found out Sirius B is exactly 10 magnitudes or 10,000 times fainter than Sirius A. Um, and by the way, Sirius A is known as the dog star. So immediately Sirius B was christened the pup. Um, Sirius B, which I have seen uh, in the past, has a beautiful, just incredibly deep blue color, but you need at least an eight inch telescope. And now is about the best time to uh, see it for the next several years. It's as far away from the main star as it gets. They determined the orbital period is about 50 years. And okay, so now we know that Sirius is visible and it's quite faint, uh, but the same mass as the sun. Well, that leads to the question of what's the temperature? Um, to tell the temperature of Sirius B, I need to take a quick detour over to a star called 40 Eridani, also known as Kide, uh, which was the first white dwarf to have a spectrum uh, taken of it. The spectrum of 40 Eridani B implied a temperature of at least 10,000 Kelvin, about half again as hot as our sun. But that star had a luminosity only one one hundredth of our sun. Well, this implied that 40 Eridani B was roughly the size as the Earth. And it's, you know, um, hot. So uh, Sirius B, when they finally got a spectrum of it, determined that, well, it's 24,000 Kelvin, uh, more than four times as hot as the sun, which meant that Sirius B, as you can see in the bottom uh, right corner, is literally the same size as the Earth, but it's as massive as the sun. That means the average density of the thing is a million times that of water, or 100,000 times greater than that of lead which we think of as very dense. Okay, that's not strange. That's just absurd. Well, okay, it's getting more curious. So by 1920, several white dwarfs were known and the question uh, then became, okay, so how does something this dense exist? What is it? And uh, we need to cue special relativity where nothing can move faster than the speed of light, technically speed of light in a vacuum. We now need to cue quantum mechanics. And one part of quantum mechanics says that particles can act as a particle and also as a wave. Well, that means that uh, if you use the de Broglie, relation and the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that there's no two electrons can occupy the same energy state. The de Broglie relation says, okay, you can uh, come up with a wavelength that is inversely proportional to the quote unquote momentum of the particle. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says you can know the momentum or the position to high precision, but not both. Well, the high density in a white dwarf 
means that it consists of atomic nuclei and those sit in a sea of electrons that are not bound to any atom. So the high density means that these electrons have to pile into higher and higher energy states. This is what we call a degenerate gas. And this pressure that holds up the white dwarf is completely independent of the temperature of the white dwarf. So the white dwarf could be absolute zero and still be stable. Well, this, um, these facts that relativity says that the speed of light is finite has some practical implications, which means that a light, you know, at some point you will put so many electrons in uh, to higher and higher energy states or momentum states that eventually you imply that the momentum will be greater than the speed of light times its mass. And that sets a maximum mass for the white dwarf star. Chandra Sekhar discovered this limit uh, while he was working uh, mathematics on a ship to England in 1930. And it turns out it's, uh, he derived 1.46 solar masses uh, we now know it's about 1.4. And this is called the Chandra Sekhar mass uh, in his honor. He actually lived long enough that they gave him a Nobel Prize for this, among other things, in 1983. Well, one of the consequences of degeneracy pressure is that more massive white dwarfs are smaller. And as I said, because uh, degeneracy pressure works independent of temperature and the white dwarf does not have any nuclear reactions to produce energy, they're destined to cool over time scales of billions of years. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. So now the question becomes, well, how do they form? Uh, one of the pioneers of stellar evolution uh, with computers uh, made the famous somewhat dismissive quote that any fool can make a white dwarf. Um, he did have to semi eat those words because they're a little more interesting than he thought. How does a white dwarf form? Our, we start with our sun, which burns hydrogen into helium in the core. Um, and that uh, place where hydrogen burns into helium is a diagonal line on a plot of effective temperature on the horizontal axis and luminosity or the absolute brightness of the star on the vertical axis. So on that diagonal line, the sun is uh, burning hydrogen to helium. Eventually the core hydrogen will run out and the hydrogen will ignite in a shell around an inert helium core it will become a red giant. And when it becomes a red giant, eventually it will ignite the helium in the core. It'll contract and become hot enough to burn into carbon and oxygen. And during that core helium burning phase, the star will be a yellow giant star about a hundred times or so brighter than it is now. Finally, the helium runs out in the core. The star uh, swells up to become a red giant again. At this point, it um, enters what's called a um, thermally pulsing phase where the helium is igniting in a shell around the carbon oxygen core. And sometimes the hydrogen ignites in a shell around that carbon oxygen core. And it's not a stable burn. It will ignite, flare up, and then um, ex that layer will expand rapidly, cool off, and go back to contracting again. Well, these what's called thermal pulses or flashes 
reach enough intensity, burn up enough of the hydrogen that finally the outer layers of the uh, red giant or red supergiant puff off and um, reveals the white dwarf to be in the center, which is extremely hot, putting out a lot of ultraviolet radiation and the surrounding gas absorbs the ultraviolet light and fluoresces and produces what we know of as a planetary nebula. And uh, this object moves over from red to blue at nearly constant uh, luminosity. And then finally, the nuclear fusion um, dies out and the star cools along a track from the upper left down to the lower right, which is what we call the white dwarf cooling curve. The, and this uh, cooling curve, the white dwarf will cool at essentially constant radius. Most of the stars are seen in the oval region uh, surrounding what's called DBV and DAV towards the bottom. These stars are typically considerably fainter than the sun. So then the question is, well, okay, how do we find these objects besides by accident? How we find them, the two properties we have to deal with is the fact that they're faint and the fact that they're quite hot. Um, so most of them, that we can see will be nearby up to maybe a few hundred light years. The bulk of them will also have a bluish color because they are so hot. Well, nearby stars in general will move more against the background stars that are very far away. This is what's called proper motion. And uh, white dwarf stars typically will have relatively large proper motions. An astronomer named Willem Leuten made it his life's goal to determine proper motions of stars, including white dwarfs in the Northern and Southern hemisphere, leading to a number of surveys. And those survey names, their initials wound up uh, becoming catalog names for a lot of the white dwarf stars. Other surveys were done for faint blue stars, including those in proper motion surveys. All of these were done either with um, film for the proper motion surveys or photomultiplier tubes with color filters for faint blue stars. Nowadays, of course, we use CCDs and the advantage of these techniques is it's much faster than collecting spectra, and we can typically find much fainter objects. And with this, we found several thousand white dwarfs over the decades. In more recent times, since about 2000 or so, uh, some of the massive surveys, such as Sloan Digital Sky Survey, have led to the discovery of tens of thousands of white dwarf candidates. But they're candidates because we need to see their spectra. Um, that's what tells us we have a white dwarf because the spectra are just strange compared to that of normal stars. And you'll see several examples over on the right hand side. They're arbitrarily um, categorized, uh, um, don't think that the flux of a hydrogen atmosphere called DA white dwarf is much more than that of say a DC white dwarf. They're scaled arbitrarily, but you can see there's hydrogen lines and only hydrogen lines in the DA white dwarf. That's Sirius B, for example. Then you get to pure neutral helium lines in a DB white dwarf. DO white dwarfs, it's helium two or ionized helium lines. You see no lines, DC and so on. 
Um, so how does that compare to say a normal star? Well, here's Sirius A and Sirius A is an A type star because the hydrogen lines are at their maximum strength. And here you can see Sirius A also has the hydrogen line, just like it's a little pup companion. The difference is, is there's lots of extra squiggles in the spectrum. And those are due to what astronomers call metals, which is all elements heavier than helium. And those metal lines are present in a main sequence star, but they're not present in a white dwarf typically. So just to recapitulate sort of, is the taxonomy of white dwarfs. And then you'll see that a number of the white dwarf spectral classes are analogs to the main sequence spectral classes. So DA white dwarfs, only hydrogen lines are present. The analog is A stars. DB analog is B stars. Now the bottom three, the DZ, where you have lines of metals, typically calcium, there's nothing like that on the main sequence. Likewise, DQ with carbon features and the DC stars. Um, some of these are lumped together because some stars wind up having, shall we say, split personality and you'll have BBA stars or DAB stars and so on. Well, so now we've uh, discussed a bit about how they form um, what they look like and how to find them. So how do we understand their cooling? Because as I mentioned, that's what these objects do. Well, we talked about the fact that the material inside a white dwarf is fully ionized and it's what we call um, electron degenerate. Well, there's more to it than just that. There's a dense plasma physics dealing with the ions in the core. Um, and that's a plasma of ions, which is typically carbon and oxygen, go in a little bit of neon and uh, some other stuff. And they're sitting in this uh, sea of electrons. The extremely high density of the material means that the ions early on are a gas, but then it condenses to a liquid. And finally, it actually crystallizes to a solid. Um, unfortunately, the interior is not pure carbon, or we could have talked about diamonds in the sky. Um, but it is a mixture of carbon, oxygen, and neon. And I'm going to show a couple of the consequences of this cooling making the interior more degenerate, namely that the degeneracy boundary uh, moves outward as the star cools, and then the star crystallizes and also the outer layers will have convection occur like boiling water in a pot. So here is a white dwarf cooling. This plot has cooling from left to right and then from bottom is the central core out to the surface layers near the top. This is a weird scale. So zero is truly zero. The minus four means one hundredth of a percent of the mass of the object. So 10 to the minus four of the mass um, is outside of or above that point. 10 to the minus eight for the minus eight. So 10 to the minus 12 is actually um, quite a low density and uh, uh, very far out in mass in the star. This is a computer model of Sirius B. So what you'll see is that there's a degeneracy boundary, a blue line that starts out in a pure helium envelope and the strong gravity of the white dwarf forces the heavier elements to sink to the center and the lighter stuff floats to the top. So, in this case, you have a pure hydrogen envelope. The degeneracy boundary starts in that helium layer, but moves out into the hydrogen layer 
and even goes all the way out into the convection zone, which starts to show up at about um, 13,000 Kelvin, or when the star is about 1 1,000th the sun's luminosity. At the bottom, you see a red line where the stars start to crystallize in the center, and that coincidentally happens when the uh, convection zone starts to form at the surface. And then you form a quantum solid um, that essentially is kind of a zero temperature solid in the center. And when that happens, um, the star can lose energy very quickly. The other thing to note is that well over 99% of the mass of Sirius B is locked up in the carbon oxygen core. You can think of the, um, you know, that carbon oxygen core is the bulk of your object. And then you have a, a thin layer of helium on top of it and just a tiny veneer of hydrogen. Well, oh, now we let's look at the cooling a little differently. Here we'll look at this as temperature from hot on the left to cold on the right, and then luminosity from bright at the top to faint at the bottom. And the, there's a series of parallel lines. The topmost one is a four-tenth solar mass white dwarf. The bottom is at 1.3 solar masses. The thick black line is uh, for a 0.6 solar mass white dwarf. And that's the most common mass for a white dwarf star. What you will see then near the top left, the symbol L gamma equals L nu. White dwarfs emit neutrinos just like the sun does, although it's a different kind. And the hottest white dwarfs actually emit more neutrinos than photons. And that means that the interior cools off rapidly early on as the neutrinos are emitted. That, that happens before 100 million years. And so, you know, any star that uh, has faded past that point, it started out doing that about the time the dinosaurs died out. You'll see a number of thick blue lines, um, easiest to see at 1.3 solar masses. That's where the core crystallizes. And the blue line is where the star starts to crystallize. It ends where 99% of the mass of the star is crystalline. And that happens anywhere from about, say, 400 million years, and for the most massive white dwarfs, all the way down to a couple of billion or three billion years for the lowest mass white dwarfs. At around two billion, two to three billion years is where the degeneracy boundary runs into the convection zone. And that is very significant because take a note of how the, those pink curves of constant age suddenly just drop. And the reason for that is, is that the energy in the core is much more efficiently radiated away when the convection zone hits the degeneracy boundary. Well, now we've seen some of the cooling and stuff. The white dwarfs have some very interesting uh, behavior. Some of these objects, pulsate. And this is what got me hooked on them many years ago when I found out they pulsate. Okay, this is cool. And what, how this happens is as a white dwarf cools, the dominant surface element, let me pick hydrogen, starts to recombine. At the hotter stars, the hydrogen is ionized. The electron can't uh, stay bound to the hydrogen atom. But at a certain temperature, they start to be able to recombine, but it's not a stable process. The electrons will recombine with their atoms, and then it'll go 
oops, did too much. And it'll start to ionize. And so it's a little heat engine that um, recombines and ionizes and recombines and ionizes. Sometimes I think of it as a white dwarf is shivering because it's rather cold. Um, the star is so dense that there's hardly any radial motion, but rather what it does is have hot and cool spots that um, show up. And it turns out that these hot and cool spots are described by mathematical functions called spherical harmonics. Um, don't worry about that. But what um, it happens is most of them are, if you look at the little uh, circles in the bottom right corner, the middle line where the top half is white, the bottom half is dark, and then you have the side towards you is dark, the side away from you is uh, bright, and then vice versa. This is what's called dipole or L equals one uh, motion of the hot cold spots. That's the dominant behavior in white dwarfs as they have that pattern. A few of them have what's called quadrupole, where there's light, dark, light uh, present. Um, none of them have the radial motion. In spite of decades of looking, we've not seen that. Um, well, the pulsations, it turns out, are a godsend and an absolute breakthrough in understanding white dwarf stars. These periodicities, which are a few hundred seconds, as you can see in the upper right panel, that's a light curve of a typical white dwarf that pulsates. There's, those periods are sensitive to the internal structure of the star, just like the tone of a bell is sensitive to the shape and size of that bell. And although the periods are short, a few hundred seconds, which means, well, in one night of observing, you can watch the star pulsate 50, 60 times, but you have whole lots of periods going at once. Well, you cannot resolve all of those periods in one night. You cannot resolve all those periods reliably in multiple nights from one place. You need to have long time spans, weeks preferably, of uninterrupted data. I happen to be part of a global network that was formed in the uh, mid 1980s when white dwarf researchers around the world realized we need to pool our resources to observe these objects and then divvy up who uh, analyzes them and gets credit for it as I'll show on the next page. Nowadays, we have a number of space probes. Koro and Kepler are defunct now, but TESS, um, which is a transiting uh, planet satellite, that's its purpose for being, but it's absolutely spiffy for variable stars, can get a month or more of continuous data. So the long interrupted data, what we did was got observing sites around the globe uh, marked with black stars. This is typical. We've had other sites in Europe and uh, Asia as well. And when uh, it um, becomes dawn for one site, we hand it off to a site where it's just becoming dark and just keep handing the object off from one telescope to the other around the globe. And we use what's called a Fourier transform to turn that light curve into a whole bunch of different frequencies as I'll show on the next um, page. Finding out these periods or frequencies and modeling them, we can determine the mass of the white dwarf the internal structure of the white dwarf, what the core is made of, 
carbon and oxygen, how much. The rotation rate of the white dwarf, spoiler alert, it's about a day. The cooling rate, if the star has magnetic fields, so far none of the pulsators do, the distance to the white dwarf, because we'll know how bright it is in terms of the luminosity. So on this page, you see light curve from that uh, Hoare telescope run. That's what we called this uh, astronomical instrument. And you can see that there are gaps, but they're not very big and they're irregularly spaced. This allowed us <clears throat> to resolve the object into a small number of discrete frequencies with a lot, without a lot of extraneous peaks due to the data gaps. In this particular case, this object has a series of dipole modes with radial overtone numbers and radial overtones is one way to think of the different notes on a clarinet or a saxophone or something when you press the different keys. You can see from radial overtone number eight to number 18, got them all. And take a look at some of the biggest peaks like number 15, the very large one on the top. It's three peaks. The number 17, you can also just make out that it's three peaks, number 13, and so on. That is the signature of the star's rotation, which is a period of about a day in the star. Analysis of this object, which I did for my thesis, determined that the mass of the star is 0.61 solar masses, and it's actually to that level of accuracy. And the helium layer, I uh, didn't mention it here, has two bumps. The outer bump is at 1.5 times 10 to the sixth of the mass of the star, so one millionth. And then there's a second bump down at about um, one one hundredth the mass of the star, which is actually consistent with stellar evolution that we would expect the helium layer to be 1% of the mass. We've also looked at the hydrogen atmosphere of white dwarfs, and there too, the helium layer is about 1% of the mass of the star. The carbon oxygen core has a discrete structure where it's oxygen rich in the center and carbon rich above these central regions. And in this particular case, it's still a liquid state, so it is not crystallized yet. There's a helium layer, and then the hydrogen layer, it turns out, and the number of these objects is this one hundredth of a percent, or 10 to the minus four of the mass of the object. And it also shows that most of them have masses near 0.6 solar masses. That hydrogen layer is 7% of the radius of the object. So about 700 uh, kilometers of uh, the star is hydrogen. The helium mantle is 17% of the radius uh, by contrast. And I've listed some uh, temperatures and densities. You can see at the base of the hydrogen layer, the density is about the same as the center of our sun, uh, 200 grams per cubic centimeter. Um, and that temperature is about half the temperature of the center of our sun. But the hydrogen layer mass up to the minus four, that's typical as you can see in the upper right corner. A lot of them do have that, but there's a scattering with even thinner hydrogen layers. And that tells us about the final stage right before the star became a white dwarf, that final pulse of hydrogen burning, when did it occur? And how much of that outer uh, layer of the red giant star puffed off? In some cases, it got rid of almost all of it. In other cases, it left as 10 to the minus four. And why is 10 to the minus four special? 
more massive than that, the hydrogen will be hot enough and dense enough that it can uh, burn by nuclear fusion and be consumed. So there is an upper limit to that hydrogen layer mass because of that. So this just shows one of the other things we can learn about white dwarfs because they pulsate. And pulsations are actually nothing special. If you look here, you will notice in the center, almost all of the dots are blue. And that indicates a white dwarf that pulsates. There's only a handful and just one in the center that's red, meaning that it does not pulsate. And then on either side are the non-pulsators. What this says is that pulsations are just a normal phase of the cooling of all white dwarfs. And that means that what we learn about the pulsators tells us about the non-pulsators as well. So it's truly um, you know, a very powerful tool. We can also, and I won't go into the details, but the most massive white dwarfs, we can actually tell from pulsation analysis that they are largely crystalline in the center. And these uh, funny numbers and uh, letters those are catalog numbers, but you can see some of these stars are already 90, 95% crystallized. And that's proving the dense plasma physics that predicts this will happen. The other thing is the age of our local galactic disk. So this is a plot from left to right of the luminosity of the white dwarf and then from bottom to top is the number density of white dwarfs. Towards the bottom means very few white dwarfs occur in a given volume of space. Towards the top means more of them exist. And you, uh, the red dots are the data. The black lines are some of the theoretical models. If on the left, um, there's not very many white dwarfs uh, per unit volume because they cool rapidly during that phase. Remember, the, these objects are emitting more neutrinos than photons. Then you get to a phase where more and more white dwarfs show up because they are... Uh, it's a long time to cool from that minus 5.8 to minus 5.4. That's roughly a billion years compared to say 100 million years. Then you see this bump at about minus three to minus 3.5 in log luminosity. That bump is the slowdown in the uh, cooling caused by the release of latent heat of energy and due to crystallization, it's just like ice freezes at a constant temperature and then only once ice is frozen can it be cooled down even more. And we can actually see this bump and that solid line includes both that release of latent heat and the phase separation of the carbon and oxygen. Uh, the solid material is oxygen rich, the liquid material is carbon rich, and that separation releases gravitational energy causing this bump. Then there's a final bump and a sudden drop. And that sudden drop is due to the finite age of our local disk which turns out to be 10 billion years in age. We've used this technique to measure the age of globular clusters, which are about 12 billion years in age. The other thing that white dwarfs have done is not just simply local, they actually are um, key to um, determining the fact that 
the expansion of our universe is actually accelerating. You might ask, okay, they're faint. How does that happen? Well, when a white dwarf, if it's in a binary system and accretes mass from a companion star, it can accrete enough mass to exceed the Chandrasekhar mass. And at that point, the white dwarf is unstable and it collapses. That collapse compresses the carbon and oxygen and it eventually burns explosively. This explosive burn causes what's known as a type 1a supernova explosion. Well, this is a Chandrasekhar mass. It's all about 1.4 solar masses. That means there's all having about the same amount of carbon and oxygen when it goes kaboom. That means they're all the same luminosity when they explode. It's what we call a standard candle, an object of a known brightness. So we can look at how faint that supernova appears to determine how far away it is. And by looking at that and comparing how bright the supernova is to how bright the galaxy that hosted that supernova is, astronomers were able to determine that the universe's expansion is actually accelerating now after the Big Bang. So that's most of the science part um, that I'm going to cover tonight. Um, a little bit about the future, what's, go what's happening now and will happen. A theoretical spectra to model the observed spectra, we're getting better at modeling the details and also modeling the oddballs like those DQ carbon atmosphere white dwarfs. Advances are being made in modeling magnetic white dwarfs, um, which I didn't touch on except very briefly. Um, we are working to model those. Space probes like TESS and successors will be generating long detailed light curves for seismology. And pulsation theory, so far we've only used the frequency of the pulsations. We have not used the changing amplitude of the pulsations to tell us what's going on in the outer layers. We know there's stuff there, but we've been throwing that information away because it's a hard problem. And better dense plasma physics is helping us to tease out details of white dwarf structure and cooling. You remember I was mentioning neon along with the carbon and oxygen. Well, it turns out the neon, even though it's only 2% of the core composition, actually is a significant contributor to the slowdown in cooling as a white dwarf crystallizes. We have to account for it to match the data better. And we're still trying to understand the details of what makes which kind of red giant star become which kind of white dwarf. So, you know, for such small stars, they're surprisingly um, massive impact, pun intended, on astrophysics. Uh, the most common endpoint of stellar evolution, I mentioned 97% become a white dwarf. Uh, we've confirmed a lot of aspects of dense plasma physics, uh, including the limiting mass. As I mentioned, Chandra Sekhar won a Nobel Prize for that effort. And we're understanding how white dwarfs come to be. With white dwarfs, we know the age of the local galactic disk and can determine the ages of open and globular clusters as well. And then, as I mentioned, supernovae type 1a have been used to show the expansion of our universe is accelerating. That got a Nobel Prize as well in 2011. So it's actually a subject where you have a chance of winning one of those. <laughs> and with that, I will be happy to take questions. All right, very nice, Paul. Um, let's see, you actually covered some of the questions already. 
uh, by talking about type one supernova. Um, I, we do have a question from Steve. I'm not sure I quite understand it, but he asks, what causes the second uh, bomb or bump maybe in the cooling curve? The second bump, that is a function of the fact that the more white dwarfs, it, it, it's a function of the fact that the um, cooling age is very nonlinear over that plot. And so that second bump is due to the fact you're lumping together pretty much all your white dwarfs between say about three or four billion years and 10 billion years, they're all getting lumped into that bin. Then they all have about the same luminosity. Um, so that's why you get that. And then that sudden fall off is just the fact that um, the local uh, galaxy is not old enough to have any more. Okay. And um, so I have a question. The you mentioned that um, the carbon and oxygen core uh, crystallizes. What form does that crystallization take? Uh, are there actually uh, white dwarfs made of diamond out there? Or is it more like layers of graphene? Or what, what kind of crystallization does that carbon take? So I'm not, I confess I have not studied the latest dense plasma physics articles. Uh, the ones that I did study some years ago, there was a lively debate over whether or not it, that material was going to become a face-centered cubic crystal or a body-centered cubic crystal. It's one or the other of those. So it's actually a cubic um, system crystal. Oh, okay. All right. Um, let's see. Those are the questions that we have so far. Um, we'll wait just a, a little bit and see if anybody types in any more questions. Uh, anyone else have a, a question for Paul or a question about white dwarfs or related astronomy? Doesn't look so... like it. Why did they emit neutrinos? Um, golly, I'm, I will have to look up and understand um, the exact process, but it's called um, plasmon um, neutrinos. And that's the kind that's most frequently emitted from the material being a very dense plasma. And it's a function of the very high heat that's still in the center of the white dwarf because a white dwarf core is 200 million Kelvin uh, when it starts to become a white dwarf. And at that high a temperature, I think it's essentially plasma oscillations that um, cause the neutrinos to be emitted. Okay, very nice. Well, thank you again for um, this great talk and uh, thanks to all the people who have been watching and listening. Um, be sure and check the PEAK website for future talks on astronomy. We typically have something most Friday evenings so uh, check out that website for further talks and thank everyone for participating.